Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're having a, a good day over there in Japan. Uh, uh, glad that I can uh, join this jamboree. Uh, this is my status of embedded Linux talk for September of 2018. And uh, this is a talk that I give uh, fairly frequently. I think I've given it at uh, most of the jamborees in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so it changes, uh, I cover about a year's period and it changes, some of the material changes and some is, uh, some doesn't change that much. But anyway, the nature of this talk is that it is a quick overview of lots of different embedded topics. Um, and it's really a springboard for further research. So if you see something interesting, uh, hopefully I've provided you uh, a link uh, or something that you can search for if you can Google uh, some of the information on here just to uh, bring yourself up to speed. So uh, one note is that this is not comprehensive. This is just material that I have seen. I've uh, done a little bit of research, but um, most of the stuff is just uh, things that kind of caught my attention over the last year uh, that I thought was interesting. And the talk is divided into uh, basically four major parts uh, with the uh, kernel versions, technology areas, then CE workgroup projects, and a couple of miscellaneous uh, items. And then I have a page with resources with links to some of the sites that I get my information from. So let's go ahead and uh, get started right with the kernel versions. So over the last um, year, uh, we've had five kernel releases, and uh, actually we'll we'll have one more uh, very likely before the end of this year. So we're we're averaging about six kernel releases a year, um, and uh, so that's really good. If you look at the the cadence for the kernel releases or how how frequently they're coming out, it's pretty consistent. It's consistent at around 70 days. Sometimes a little bit less than 70 days, sometimes a little bit more. Notice it's always a multiple of seven. That's because the kernel releases are always done on a Sunday. So uh, you might not know exactly which week, but you do know which day of the week a uh, kernel will come out on. If you look at this past history over the last year, um, we had one kernel release that was longer, and that was because it included Spectre and Meltdown fixes. And uh, those are those are very serious bugs that I'm sure you've heard of. If you've heard my presentation, I've talked to, about those in great detail. And I'll talk a little bit about some more uh, bugs in the Spectre and Meltdown class that have been fixed in recent kernels. Uh, but it's amazing that uh, even with these very, very serious security issues, uh, that release will only extend it by seven days. Um, and that's because uh, uh, the kernel development process is heavily pipelined. So people are working on these. The, the patches for the fixes for Spectre and Meltdown were worked on for six, over a six month period. Uh, but it didn't, even though they were significant patches, they just came into the regular workflow of the kernel and got integrated uh, when it was appropriate to do so. Um, and so it didn't, it didn't impact the rest of the kernel any, any more than anything else impacts uh, the kernel in terms of its delivery, which is actually pretty interesting. It tells you that uh, Linux has some very good um, processes in place. Uh, well, one other note I'll make, uh, well, a couple of additional notes. So Linux 4.18 is the currently uh, published, released kernel, where I think I checked on the website, we're at 18.10. So there have been 10 kind of incremental patch sets applied to 4.18 uh, since August, uh, 12th of August. Uh, and uh, we're now on the 4.19 series. We're on release candidate five this week. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, and I'll talk a lot more about this later, is that the author of this release, the, the person in charge of the release, is now Greg Pearl Hartman. And uh, I'll talk about the reasons for that, but this is the first time in uh, the history of Linux, 27 years, uh, that someone besides Linus Torvalds has been in charge of a release. <laughs> and so uh, Greg took over on kind of short notice, but he's, uh, uh, so far he's been doing it for about a week and a half. Seems, things seem to be going okay. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, so we expect 4.19 probably about October 21st. That would be about right. There's a major conference in Europe uh, the week following October 21st. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Greg tried to get that release done before he had to head off to that conference. Um, 
So uh, let's go through some of the features uh, that are related to embedded that were in some of these kernels over the last year. Uh, so starting with Linux 4.14, which was released uh, about a year ago, about uh, 10 months ago, really. Um, so there was a new stack unwinder uh, called ORC, uh, and that's an acronym for something. I don't remember the acronym, but uh, that was for x86-64. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, issues with just unwinding the kernel stack. Uh, one of the most visible uh, places where you see this is with OOPS reports. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, but there's also uh, debuggers that use the stack unwinder and, and uh, tracing tools and things. Uh, the ability to be able to see what was the sequence of calls that led into a routine is very useful. Um, and there's a new mechanism for doing this. The old mechanism was not as reliable. There were places where it would kind of have to guess what call routine was. And that's because the kernel is fairly complicated in terms of how it calls things. There are things that go through assembly uh, where you don't have normal C stack frames. Uh, but anyway, there's a better unwinding. Uh, it's, it's done using some out-of-band structures uh, that are kept along with the kernels, some extra debug information. Uh, but anyway, if you, and it's suspected uh, that this will be applied to other architectures. So although this feature was released for x86-64, it'll, it'll make its way to ARM and ARM64 and other, other platforms in the near future. Uh, also in this release, we saw a Z standard compression for ButterFS and SquashFS. I'll talk about that later. Uh, we saw better CPU-free coordination with SMP, so some power management things. Now this list is not complete. There were a lot of other things in 4.14, but I kind of focus on just the things that might be interesting from an embedded standpoint. So some of the debugging and the compression and the power management, uh, those are things that you might be interested in. Uh, 4.15, uh, we saw uh, CRAMFS support for mapping persistent memory. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, so there's not a lot of systems out there that are doing execute in place. But on the very, very low end systems, there are still some, some people who do that. And uh, CRAMFS stands for Compressed RAMFS. And actually, when you do XIP, uh, execute a place, you have to have uncompressed. So it's a, you can actually turn off the compression in the compressed RAMFS, which is a little bit strange. But uh, it's, a, it's an in-memory file system. And uh, you, being able to map it to persistent memory means that you can uh, uh, use uh, uh, flash that's been mapped directly into the uh, address space of the kernel for file systems and, and do some interesting stuff there. So that's really good. Um, the AMD Display Core system was accepted. Uh, device Tree Compiler also now has support for overlays in this release. There was RISC-V support, so there's a new, uh, well, I don't know how old RISC-V is, but to the kernel, this is fairly new support for a brand new hardware architecture that's open open hardware architecture. And the big news of this release uh, was, of course, the Spectre and Meltdown mitigations. Uh, two very large patch sets uh, uh, with a lot of impact, uh, introducing something called KPTI, which is K kernel page table page. Well, I can't remember what the KPTI stands for. Uh, I have a section of it later in the talk. And then also something called Red uh, Page table isolation, that's what it is. Uh, and so, and I'll talk. I'll talk more about those. In terms of 4.16, uh, we had initial support for the jailhouse hypervisor. So the jailhouse hypervisor is, is used by Siemens uh, in some of their products, uh, industrial automation, and some embedded products. And it's a, a kind of a lighter weight uh, hypervisor uh, or embedded. So that's good. Some eBPF support for functions. Uh, eBPF is the extended Berkeley packet filter. And it's a virtual machine architecture inside the kernel for running uh, code uh, uh, that comes from user space but is not native code. It's a, a virtual machine P code. And uh, so it's being used for a lot of different things. Mainly, uh, mainly currently, it's used in two areas, which is in the networking uh, to do, uh, it's starting to replace some of the network filtering. It's also being used with tracing to, to provide functional, function support uh, for, for tracing. So you can do kind of do an arbitrary sequence of code when a trace point is hit. Uh, 
so and also in 4.16, we started to see mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown for uh, non-Intel. So uh, both of these uh, bugs affect more than just the Intel platform. Uh, in fact, Spectre uh, applied to pretty much any uh, architecture that supported uh, speculative execution. And so uh, it took a while to get the ARM64 mitigations uh, out there. Uh, but there, they were uh, added, and there were some additional Spectre mitigations uh, that didn't make the 4.15 release, but that were included in this release. So the array index no spec is is one one mitigation that was has been added, and then uh, high resolution timers now have two modes to allow them to be run in interrupt context. So that's uh, useful. Uh, there are some real time applications where you need access to these timers. Uh, very early in, in our handlers, and uh, uh, so that's that's uh, a, a nice improvement there. Um, continuing with 4.16, there have been uh, a lot of improvements to the F2FS, which is a flash-based file system um, that was introduced in the kernel by Samsung. We saw some new subsystems added in the area of audio support, uh, particularly for sound, slim bus and sound wire. Uh, these are two MIPI standards for audio bus, uh, and so it's nice to continue to see support for uh, these things that are standardized outside the kernel. And then uh, Flex and Bison are required for the kernel build. So uh, Flex and Bison are the GNU renames of the tools previously known as uh, Lex and Yak. Um, and uh, they, they are used for compiling compilers, compiling parsers. Um, and it you, didn't used to be the case that the parser code was required for the kernel build, but now, now it is. So as you move to newer and newer kernels, uh, there are additional requirements for the tool chain and the build environment that you need with the kernel. So if you run into these problems, you'll get error messages. If, once, once you switch to a, a kernel later than 4.16, it's pretty easy to fix if you're on it. Ubuntu system just or Debian system just app get these packages, uh, but it is something the, to be aware of uh, if you see those errors. Um, let's see, in 4.17, uh, there were a bunch of old architectures that were actually dropped from the kernel. This is only the third time ever that a kernel release has shrunk, um, and so you can see the list there uh, removed about uh, close to 500,000 lines of code, which is a lot of code. Uh, these architectures, there's a lot of discussion before these were dropped, but uh, uh, no one stepped forward to say they wanted to continue to maintain them. And uh, without that kind of maintenance, it was kind of considered that these were now obsolete. Um, and so if anyone had stepped forward, I'm sure the community would have worked with them to figure out a, a way to preserve these. But uh, since no one did, they're, they're gone. And uh, they actually could be put back in if someone stepped up to maintain them, but uh, you have to have someone who's interested and willing to do that work. Uh, in terms of power management, there was rework of the kernel idle loop. Uh, there was a full in-kernel TLS protocol support that was added. Uh, and I'll talk about that when I talk about networking later. And then improved CPU load estimation. Uh, also having to do with, uh, well, this had to do with uh, not so much power management as responsiveness of the system. Uh, and in fact, I'll talk about it now. So this is an improved CPU load estimator. So the kernels had something called PELT, or P-E-L-T, per entity load tracking mechanism, it has been in the kernel for a while. But uh, there were complaints that uh, it did not um, keep track of the information quickly enough. Uh, so uh, there's a, what you do when you track load load information about processes is you kind of see what it's doing right now and you try to take into account what it's doing right now and a little bit of its history. And uh, if you take the history too much into account, then uh, then you don't, your estimate is off. Um, and so there were so, some modifications to that. Uh, the basic idea is that you want to assign the right amount of CPU cycles to each process uh, so that uh, apps that need to be responsive can can um, get the CPU cycles quicker. Uh, so for instance, uh, when you switch applications in a mobile phone, you want it to come to the foreground more quickly and get the resources it needs. You know, uh, it's, so this is really about adding responsiveness. Uh, 
So it does add some scheduling overhead to do a lot of these extra calculations. Uh, requires setting sketch util estimate uh, or util est in as a uh, scheduler feature bit. Um, but you can read about how to use this. Um, so if you hire, are having an application or you're having problems with responsiveness or interactiveness for uh, your embedded applications, this is something that you probably want to take a look at. Uh, there were some other things in 4.17, a formal kernel memory modern, uh, memory ordering model. Um, and uh, that uh, this is the first time I think we've seen formal methods to try and prove things about the kernel. These are uh, this is a, a mechanism to uh, try to uh, do code proofs. Basically, look at the source code and prove that uh, it that certain sequences of instructions will actually not violate the memory ordering model. Um, and so this this is very interesting because it's part of the kind of static analysis of the kernel uh, to make it uh, robust. And there's a lot of interest in this because uh, Linux is being used in a lot of safety critical applications. Uh, in this release, the kernel build now requires GCC 4.5 or later, or later <coughs> uh, at least on x86. Um, uh, this is a problem for some architectures where GCC support has been dropped. Uh, so there are some, there's a couple of ARM v4 architectures uh, using the version 4 of the ARM architecture uh, instruction set that uh, are not supported by GCC anymore and, and not these later versions of GCC. So there are workarounds. You can apply some patches to, um, to allow supporting this. But increasingly, uh, we're going to see the kernel requiring later and later versions of uh, GCC. So if someone wants their architecture not to get stranded, they need to make sure that GCC has support for their instruction set. They need to do maintenance on the, on the tool chain side. Um, and then there were changes to the x86 system call implementation, which I thought was really interesting. After 30 years of uh, working in Linux, or 27 years, they, uh, I mean, there have been improvements to the system call implementation over time, but it's, it's such a core thing that for them to find uh, more optimizations is pretty amazing. Uh, now, 4.18 is the most recent kernel released in August. And uh, just a couple of things that caught my attention. Uh, in terms of uh, power and encryption and uh, actually Berkeley packet filters again. Uh, so the first one is power domains now support uh, what is called active state management. So modern SOCs have on them uh, various um, uh, power domain blocks. So there's lots of, uh, there's lots of parts of a modern uh, <coughs> system on chip. Uh, processor. Uh, so you have like uh, audio codecs and video codecs and things that are managing, uh, you know, buses and things like that. And a lot of these could be turned on and off uh, through uh, the kernel. Uh, well, they can be enabled and disabled. But now um, there's a, this this feature that's been added to 4.18 now allows you to handle uh, different idle states. And uh, the reason that's good is because sometimes uh, there's a trade-off, usually, when you power down a block of uh, uh, transistors on the SOCs, uh, and how fast you can bring a block back up. You have to basically reinitialize it. And the deeper uh, of an idle state you go, the more costly it is, the more time consuming it is to, to turn it back on again. So being able to kind of, basically, it allows you to turn things kind of half off or a third off uh, and be able to bring them back quick, more quickly. So you're not saving as much power, but your system is more responsive. So, and then you can adjust the, the state to compensate, uh, to, to be where you want it to be, basically. And this also apply, uh, applies not just to uh, enabling and disabling, but also to CPU frequency, uh, changing the CPU frequency and, and that type of thing. So there's uh, the different idle states. That have, there's a continuum of operation. Uh, FScript supports, uh, which is switching topic completely to uh, cryptography and encryption. So FScript is the main subsystem inside the kernel that deals with uh, providing cryptographic functions. And it now supports uh, two new ciphers that are called spec128 and spec256. Uh, the, however, so th this was added over 
Uh, there were a lot of there was a lot of controversy over adding these specification or these uh, ciphers, um, and the reason for that is that they were written by the the NSA, uh, National Security Agency of the United States of America, and people. There are some people who don't trust the NSA, uh, so uh, there was a lot of controversy, and they wanted, and there was a lot of discussion about, well, you know, has someone put a backdoor in? But the idea uh, is that uh, these are one first; these are very, very simple encryption systems, and they have been analyzed re uh, very extensively. So so far, no one's found any problems with them. Uh, and no one's been able to detect any kind of backdoor. And the, in fact, the, the core of uh, these is about seven lines of C code. It uses very, very lightweight functions. The whole idea of these is that they're, they're very lightweight uh, in terms of implementation. They're basically software encryption things. And, uh, and they're intended to be used in devices which where uh, that would not normally use encryption at all. The standard uh, encryption algorithm uh, standard cipher is AES, uh, Advanced Encryption System, uh, and AES is fairly heavyweight, and, and it's used uh, extensively on all kinds of, well, medium and high-end devices. Uh, but there are a lot of devices where that are just really not capable of doing AES, and so this is intended to fill the gap. So people on the mailing list were talking about, well, there's all these low-end phones that, you know, if you have a sub $100 phone, uh, it'd still be nice to offer the users the ability to encrypt their data. Um, and so the idea is that, well, it, encryption encryption from the NSA is better than no encryption at all. Uh, uh, you can make your own decision on that, uh, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, these are available now, and I'm sure that people will continue to try and stress these ciphers and, and see if they can find any problems with them. Uh, but they're in the kernel, so people can play around with it. And then the last thing is uh, BP filter uh, user mode helper system. And uh, I need to explain this one in, in a little bit more detail to kind of say why it's interesting. So uh, the Berkeley packet filters uh, is on a path to replace uh, the net filter code. Uh, and uh, so what that means is the net filter code, in order to build a router or to do VPN or, or operations like that where you're filtering a lot of uh, networking traffic, uh, there were these rule tables that you would set up. There was a net filter configuration language. And uh, that configuration language would be inserted into the kernel and then it would be interpreted. So P, the, the kernel had code that basically followed the instructions of config language and, and it accepted or rejected packets. Well, it turns out that that's not the most efficient way uh, to do things uh, because one, inside the kernel you have loaded all of the possible uh, all of the possible ways of accepting and rejecting packets that, that are um, that could be used. So you have this big space of code that that is used, uh, and if the configuration doesn't end up using some of that, you just have dead code. So that's a waste. And it's also, it takes a lot of more execution time to interpret the configuration language and execute it. Um, so what they want to do is they want to replace that with Berkeley Packet Filter. And uh, what that will do is that instead of loading a configuration language that's interpreted by the kernel, they'll actually load some uh, uh, P code uh, basically a uh, virtual machine language that is uh, loaded into the kernel and then actually compiled into native code by a just-in-time compiler. So we'll get native execution speed instead of interpreted execution speed. Um, and so, but here's the problem. So, and, and also you're not, you're only loading, you're only loading into the filtering area the code that you're actually going to use. You don't load in a bunch of, you don't have a bunch of other code lying around that you're not using. Uh, the problem is that uh, you have to support the old net filter config protocol, uh, and that is crazy hard. And the people in the kernel did not want to um, did not want to uh, leave both turned on. They didn't want to have all of the net filter code turned on as well as the the BP filter. So they have come up with this really really complicated mechanism uh, to 
to put the NetFilter compiler code uh, into the kernel source tree uh, and uh, compile it uh, into a, a bundle, an object bundle, that they put into a kernel loadable module. Okay, so, so far that's nothing uh, new. But they're going to, when you load this module, it's going to take that bundle and the kernel's going to execute it in user space, but initiate it from kernel space. So it's a user space program executing completely under kernel control and in a special privileged mode. Um, and so this is, this is the first time they've ever done something like this. It's kind of crazy. And, uh, and there's a lot of really interesting things you can do uh, once you have this mechanism. You could, um, there are people talking about uh, using it for uh, really complicated security protocols um, and other stuff where basically uh, it's things that you don't want to run in kernel space because you don't trust them completely or there might be bugs that could have security ramifications or things like that, but that you still would like in some kind of privilege level. So uh, this is a very complicated mechanism. I'm sure we'll start to see some really interesting things. The interesting one thing about this is that the code to this whole mechanism is now in 4.18, but they didn't actually finish the uh, NetFilter config compiler, which is the entire, entire intent of this thing. So that is yet to be uh, upstreamed, uh, but they have this big mechanism now to handle it. So that is definitely something to watch. Um, and then my last thing about 4.18 uh, is support for the Qualcomm Snapdragon processor, the 845. Uh, so this is actually used in high-end mobile devices. Uh, I think this is one of the first times we've seen this level of support. Other, other Qualcomm uh, processors used in high-end phones have do have some support upstream. In fact, I was involved with one of them when I was at Sony Mobile. Uh, but this one is actually coming from Qualcomm uh, and or Lenaro. And uh, support is incomplete, but it's a really good start. Uh, hopefully, we'll continue to see a lot of these uh, high-end mobile SOCs supported up in, uh, in mainline at top of tree. So I think that was uh, worth noting. So now the last thing is 4.19. So 4.19 is not actually released yet, but we've had the merge window. Uh, so these are the things that we pretty much uh, expect will be in there. Nothing, uh, things don't really change radically unless some major flaw is found. Uh, but uh, we're on release candidate five, and so we're kind of winding down on this. It'll probably be another three weeks before we get the release, but uh, these are the things we expect to see. And oh, just a couple of things. and. Uh, uh, one is uh, L1TF, uh, which is a, another variant of Meltdown. Uh, that stands for the Level 1 uh, Termination Fault Mitigation. And uh, you would have to look at the article to see kind of the details of what this is about. But this is another problem with speculative execution, and we expected this. We expected to see a lot of variants of Meltdown and Spectre uh, to be to be found and uh, need fixes for. The interesting thing about this L1TF uh, mitigation is that the, um, the process went really well. Uh, it was found, uh, there was a, a, few, a couple of weeks of embargo uh, where the information was not shared widely, but a group of people worked behind the scenes to fix it and it made, the fixes made it into a release very quickly. Uh, so um, that's actually really good. Uh, another thing in this release was time-based packet transmission. Uh, this allows a program to schedule data for transmission in the future, um, which is uh, something that could be is very useful in certain industrial automation settings uh, to be able to do kind of real-time networking. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then uh, AeroFS, uh, the enhanced read-only file system. Uh, is a new file system uh, that is high performance. Uh, it's been optimized for read-only, and uh, it's good in certain embedded situations, mainly in mobile. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is it's went into staging, which means it's not completely finished, but uh, people are looking at uh, trying to do good things with that. Um, and then in terms of contributor stats, uh, I think it's interesting to look at kind of where we are we had uh, about, well, 12,879 change sets. 
there's about 500,000 lines added and about 650,000 lines uh, removed. So actually a little bit more removed than were added. Uh, uh, and then there were 1,600 developers of which, of those 1,600, uh, 226 made their first contribution. And you can see this is a chart showing that first-time contributors uh, are, uh, is fairly steady, actually. It's, it oscillates between 200 and 300 people uh, each release are submitting their very first patch. So that's actually a pretty good sign that the community is healthy and people are joining it. Um, now I'm going to move on to technology areas, and uh, a lot of these areas I've talked about in past uh, jamborees, and you probably have seen some of this, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. I know you guys can have a uh, lunch break after this, so, uh, and there's a couple of things at the end I really want to have some time to talk about, so I'm going to go through technology areas pretty quickly. And in terms of boot up time, uh, there's not a lot new that's gone into the kernel. The most recent thing was this analyze boot tool. That was in 4.12. If you if you want to look at boot time, there's a couple of talks here that uh, are worth looking at. Um, in terms of device tree, not a, not a lot of new stuff in device trees. Uh, there's still uh, Pantelis and Grant are still working on a, a validation uh, system uh, to try and try and make it so that you can uh, test your bindings um, and make sure that you have the right things in them. You don't make mistakes. Uh, and they're also working on an updated updated device tree specification. In terms of uh, file systems, uh, F2FS is starting to become a fairly mature uh, file system with lots of uh, kind of support uh, for things normally found in uh, kind of higher end, like ext4, butterfs file systems. So it added lost and found support. It's got some really good tuning for low end devices and a lot of miscellaneous fix ups. Uh, ButterFS and SquashFS uh, added support for Z STD, I think, I pronounce it Z standard, but uh, Z standard compression. Um, and this is a smaller and faster compression decompression. Uh, so it's uh, actually really good. You can actually go see some uh, data on uh, how it performs relative to other ones. So uh, that's good. If you're using either of those file systems, it's good to look at that. In terms of <laughs> graphics, uh, uh, kind of interesting stuff, and this is a little bit old, uh, is support for virtual reality. There's a lot of uh, interesting, difficult problems for virtual reality. Uh, the frame rates have to be really high, and, and uh, there's a lot of issues with uh, synchronizing the, the multiple images. Uh, in terms of GPU drivers, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, code that is upstream, and a lot of code that uh, still needs to be written, uh, but uh, between the major uh, suppliers of uh, graphics processing units, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, Broadcom, Qualcomm, Vivante, all of those have upstream support, uh, varying quality. And uh, so that's pretty good. The, only, the outstanding one is ARM uh, with their Molly series, but even there's some work going on there as well. In terms of networking, uh, the big news recently has been kind of time-sensitive networking, which is just kind of a really another name for real-time networking. Uh, so uh, making, trying to make it so that the delays are, um, are uh, deterministic and uh, using SOTX time for high-resolution transmit time. And I think that actually played into the next feature here, which is time-based packet transmission. So it turns out to be really uh, handy to be able to send a packet, not just right now, but at a high resolution point sometime in the future. Um, and this is good for, uh, in, in consumer electronics space, this is good for things like uh, transferring video. You might be able to uh, uh, specify to send a certain frame uh, at a particular time in the future, and, and if, if you can get the variance of the packet transmission and arrival times lower, uh, you have to do less buffering on both sides of the connection. So that's uh, really useful. And then Bluetooth 5 is supported, uh, so that's good. In terms of power management, uh, these are two things I mentioned previously, but basically the, they reworked the kernel idle loop. Uh, they uh, did some refactoring to change uh, the way the CPUs were spending uh, time in idle. Uh, on some desktop systems, this was reducing the idle power uh, by about 10%, so that is very significant. If, uh, depending on your device and what it's, uh, how it works, if it spends a lot of time in idle, being able to use 10% less less ba battery 
while the system isn't idle is a pretty big deal. Uh, and then there's the power domain state management that I talked about uh, already. Uh, so you can now uh, manage the different uh, power domains on an SOC in a more flexible manner. And here are some uh, presentations. This one is about energy aware scheduling. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of work going on in different areas of power management. Um, in terms of real time, the real time preamp patch set is uh, pretty good. I uh, still got a couple of things still left out of tree. These are the hard parts. Uh, last time I talked to someone, I think uh, was, I think I talked to someone last year at ELC Europe, and they said uh, it was about 40k of patches left, which is not a lot. Uh, so they're continuing to make good progress. Um, and uh, notice that they're focused on LTS releases, so they're not releasing the RT preamp patch set for every kernel release, just the LTS releases. Uh, and then here's some presentations. The RT preempt is not the only one. There's also Zenomai. And then Sandra Capri gave a talk about how much soft real time you can get even if you don't use the RT preempt patch set. Um, so that's pretty good stuff. So um, let's see. In, in terms of security, the big, big news was about vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, there's a, security covers a whole lot of topics from hardening to uh, well, boot, all, all kinds of topics. But the, the big news this last year has been about Spectre and Meltdown uh, having to do with uh, speculative execution. And it's a whole family of vulnerabilities related to that. Um, so a lot of modern processors are vulnerable, mostly the higher end ones that had kind of more complicated speculative execution pipelines. Uh, many embedded processors, lower end processors, were not affected. But uh, it was a very, very severe problem. Uh, basically, uh, end users could read data or processes could read data they were not supposed to. Uh, it's a vulnerability that existed for a long, long time and finally was discovered and, and uh, fixes are starting to pour in. in the, over the last, so the main Meltdown Inspector uh, releases were, uh, or the mitigations were done in January and again in May, and some recent ones have, have cropped up over the summer. So there's just a couple of new Spectre variants, Rogue System Register Read, Speculative Store Bypass. The details on these are, are kind of interesting to read, but they're, uh, you have to kind of be a security expert to figure out. They're very, very, uh, very, very complicated uh, attacks. Uh, and particularly this, this meltdown variant, L1TF, the L1 Cache Termination Fault Vulnerability, uh, is really, really uh, tricky, uh, but that's that's the nature of the game in in uh, security. This one L1TF had to do with uh, people being able to reuse page table entries after uh, the page some page table counter had wrapped around, and so it took about three hours of uh, exhaustively. Uh, uh, blowing through the page table entries uh, to actually trigger the bug, but once you triggered it, uh, you ended up with full control over the system. So it was uh, it's a it's another nasty one, and the fix is in 4.9 uh, yeah 4.19. Um, so anyway, uh, this is not a big surprise. We were expecting new variations of speculative execution vulnerabilities. Uh, so, but it's kind of a pain. We have to keep working on it. Um, let's see. There's some. Presentations, if you, if, uh, so, you know, this couple of these are uh, talking about secure boot, uh, security features for UBIFS, which is security in the file system. Uh, so, lots of resources available if, you, if you're interested in security. In terms of system size, not a whole lot of new stuff uh, going on, uh, but if you're interested, uh, definitely check out these talks um, on how to make your system smaller and um, some of the tips and tricks for that. Um, in, in areas of testing, uh, again, we're kind of getting low on time, so I'm going to uh, go a little bit faster through some of these. Not a lot of new stuff going on with K-Self-Test. This is a unit test system that's inside the kernel source tree. Um, Fuego, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of uh, project, what's going on, but we're basically we're working on the 1.4 release right now. We've got some interesting new features, but not ready to announce them yet because they're not frozen. Um, kernelci.org uh, is, a, is a good project that's been doing a lot of continuous integration testing of the kernel. And Lenaro has a relatively new 
uh, kernel testing effort called LKFT, Linux kernel functional testing. Kernel CI really focuses on build and boot testing, and LKFT is more focused on functional testing. So once the kernel is up and running. Okay. Um, so, okay. yeah. Today, today uh, uh, Hiramachi-san is coming, and he will go, going to make some of the uh, presentation about it. And he made it in uh, uh, Linaro Correct Connect. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, great. And maybe you will be able to talk, uh, talk to him uh, if you are interested in Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. Like this, you can make uh, some interrupt to his presentation. But uh, if you'd like to make interrupt, please use this microphone. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> this microphone is uh, picking up uh, your voices so that uh, it's something of the heart of your voices, speaker. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Oh. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so the um, next next thing is, uh, well, next, not no pun intended. So there's a tree in the kernel ecosystem called the Next tree, Linux Next. Uh, that's used for integrating all of the uh, different uh, trees before it gets submitted to Linux. Um, and so there's been a lot of discussions about making sure that that tree is actually testable because uh, the more bugs that you can remove before they get to Linus, the better. Uh, you don't want to just fix the conflicts, but you want to, there's a lot of kind of tricky things that happen, interactions as uh, different systems add code. So there's been a lot of discussions. Uh, there were a lot of discussions last summer. There are a lot more discussions this summer about uh, ways to improve the testability of Linux X. And uh, the result is that uh, Stephen Roth Rothwell, who's the next maintainer, uh, is creating a fixes branch. He's doing some other things that are really useful to help with that. In terms of tool chains, GCC 8, uh, if you're not using it yet, I would recommend uh, checking it out. It's got some nice new features. Uh, shows uh, particularly the, the better error messages and the fix it hints uh, are really a lot better error reporting uh, to help you uh, debug uh, source code problems. Um, tracing, not a lot of uh, information. Dynamic fun function tracing events, that's actually kind of uh, oldish news. Uh, let's see, then miscellaneous, we got year 2038 work, uh, Git protocol version 2 and Android kernel status, so I'll go through those real quick. So year 2038, uh, there's been a lot of small driver fixes that were put into 4.16, um, and uh, the, basically a lot of the work has to do with just converting all of the timestamps from 32 bits to 64 bits. So if you're not familiar with year 2038, uh, the problem, it's that uh, uh, Unix and Linux, as kind of a follower uh, of the Unix tradition, have always stored their uh, the time in a 32-bit value, uh, and that's fine. But after a certain number of years, that overflows. So it's much, much like the Y2K bug. <coughs> so all Linux systems that were using only 32-bit values for the timestamps would have uh, kind of weird problems. A little bit hard to predict what things would go wrong. So there's been a big effort to convert over to 64-bit timestamps. <clears throat> and you may think that this is a little bit early to be doing this since it's 20 years away, but uh, there are there are embedded things that uh, uh, Linux, the current versions of Linux will be put into that may be still operating in 20 years. So there's actually been some uh, some urgency to get this stuff done so that it won't, it won't hit us later. Um, Let's see, there's a new, new Git protocol, version 2s, uh, was worked on by Google that uh, improves performance for very large repositories like the kernel, so that's uh, something good. And then Android kernel, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, Lenaro's been doing a lot of work on trying to continue to get uh, Android features up into mainline, and particularly into the long-term stable releases. They're down to about only 41K of differences between stock Android uh, and uh, and upstream, which is pretty pretty amazing. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can get a lot more details in this talk by Emil Pundar. Um, now, uh, switching gears to the CE workgroup projects. Uh, just uh, CE workgroup has just a couple of main focus areas, probably four here, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, so we're working on a shared embedded distribution. Uh, the purpose of this is to create an industry-supported distribution of embedded Linux. Uh, and this is uh, really kind of geared uh, towards leveraging, most of this work is really geared towards leveraging the security that the Debian project is doing. Uh, 
uh, security uh, research and patches and, and package maintenance. And so uh, there's work on uh, building Debian with the Octo project, the Meta Debian project, and then uh, other projects like ISAR and LV uh, are collaborating. Um, and uh, uh, these are different systems all having to do with Debian and how it can be used in uh, embedded systems. Um, anyway, so there's continued integration of Debian-based build and packaging systems that's going on. Oh, well, that's OK. Um, Let's see, in terms of uh, another big project of the CE uh, Core Embedded Linux project is a long-term support initiative uh, or long-term support for the industry. Uh, this, the current LTSI is based on 4.9, but uh, we've actually had the merge window and we're working on progress for the next release, which will be 4.14. And uh, the, you can actually, if you want to look at this and test it, you can uh, get the release candidate now. Uh, so most of the industry uh, is using either LTS or LTSI, uh, and th these are really, really handy. Uh, it's good to be on these because these are where the security fixes will, will be put. And so, um, so for instance, Spectre and Meltdown, uh, the patches and L1TF and, and some of the other things, uh, the patches for those have been backported to the long-term stable releases, and that includes LTSI. Um, and so uh, uh, it's you. Those are not backported to the non-LTS kernels, and so that's important. So here's actually the long-term stable release situation as it stands today. Um, Three point sixteen is being supported. Uh, Four point four uh, until twenty twenty two, and four point nine until twenty twenty three. Um, and 4.14 until 2020. So uh, some of these kernels, like the 4.9, will be supported for quite a while. Notice I uh, uh, 4.19 has already been designated as a long-term stable release, even though it has not been uh, released yet. So it'll probably be released next month, um, but we don't know what the end of end of life will be. Uh, it could be the standard two years, or it could be something longer, uh, depending on a lot of factors. Uh, but so this uh, long-term stable releases continue to be developed um, and supported. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so also uh, one of the things that the work group is doing is they've been funding the Fuego uh, test framework, which is an embedded Linux test framework. Uh, and this is one of the projects that they funded uh, in the spring. Uh, to add an integrated release uh, test, uh, self-test, uh, and that work was completed. Uh, Fuego continues to uh, be developed and is used uh, to test AGL and uh, uh, also some other projects. Um, uh, one of the other things that uh, the Core Embedded Linux project do is doing is uh, really uh, supporting work in the area of automated testing standards. As, as kind of an extension of the Fuego work. So uh, you may not know this, but uh, CE, uh, CELP is a sponsor of the Automated Testing Summit. Uh, and this is a summit that's coming up in October of Test Framework Architects. Uh, the goal is to increase collaboration between projects. There's been a survey uh, that's been sent out of, uh, uh, for the different uh, architects to uh, describe their systems and how they fit into a model that we've come up with. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions on, a, on an automated testing uh, mailing list. This one was chosen, it's not specific to Yocto project, but they had a list already that had the name automated testing, so we kind of uh, just piggybacked on top of that. And uh, Kevin Hillman and I uh, developed a, a test stack model uh, that we were going to present at the test summit. and. Uh, and then start to talk about uh, interfaces and stuff. So here's here's one part of the model that we're developing. Uh, the kit, this is a uh, these blocks and these lines uh, are part of the continuous integration loop. And we've tried to identify the different um, pieces and the different components. One of the big problems with automated testing in Linux is that um, these pieces don't talk to each other. So you have Lava that does a lot of these boxes, uh, and you have, uh, but you have other systems like Fuego that has a lot of 
somewhat different boxes, and you have uh, zero day that has different boxes, and uh, lab grid and R4D and and uh, kernel CI, and, and so and the thing is, everyone ha is having to build the same thing over and over again. So it's it's almost it's kind of silly because it's all open source. We should be able to inter uh, interchange these components and and allow them uh, to be developed with less effort and. Uh, and reuse software between the projects. And so we're going to be focusing uh, in the testing summit when we talk about these different interfaces uh, between the components and how we might standardize those. So that's something uh, to pay attention to. So I think there'll be some good work that comes out of that uh, in the next uh, year or two. Um, and then the other major project of the uh, uh, work group is the eLinux Wiki. We have uh, lots of material up there and lots of different domain areas, uh, but the most important thing I think up there is the slides and videos for um, all of our conferences. Uh, we have lot, literally hundreds of uh, talks and, and links to hundreds of videos, uh, so if you, uh, there's, if you are curious about um, a particular Linux subsystem or drivers or, or technology area, you can go there and find good information on it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is some of the stuff that's been going on recently in the eLinux Wiki. Um, and uh, so you can you can go uh, please go out and use the site and also uh, encourage you to edit the site. So now other stuff. So uh, I'm going to cover a couple other kind of miscellaneous issues, not really technical issues, um, but uh, community issues. And I'll start with something that uh, you probably have heard this, uh, but very very interesting uh, development that Linus has uh, taken a break. I talked about that. Uh, Talked about this, but and and also there's a new code of conduct for the kernel community. So let, I'm going to talk about both of those. So Linus announced on September 16th that he's taking a break, and he actually made an apology for what he called uh, flippant attacks in emails that have been both unprofessional and uncalled for. So he's uh, he's uh, after years of kind of. Uh, uh, well, not every message, I, I need to make sure I phrase this correctly, because not every message from Linus has been bad. And there's been, uh, I think, kind of an overreaction in the press that uh, that he's much worse than he is. But he has, on occasion, used kind of unprofessional language, and he's he's uh, been harsh on uh, people who contributed. Um, anyway, he said he's going to step down for a bit, and he announced that Greg Crow Hartman will take his place for the 4.19 release cycle. And uh, there's some links so you can see his, his actual announcement is that lkml.org link um, made on uh, 916. Uh, but uh, there's a couple of interesting things, I think. Um, uh, so first, Linus says he's not burned out. Okay, So a lot of people were worried that he was just kind of throwing up his hands and going away. And that's, that's not true. He said he just needs time to reflect. There's actually uh, a really, really good article that came out just today. Uh, from the BBC, uh, Linus Torvalds uh, gave a lot more perspective on kind of how he feels about uh, uh, his past behavior and what kind of led him after kind of years of not saying that there was a problem, he finally changed his mind and, and agreed that there uh, could be uh, a problem. And one of the quotes from the article is, I'll never be cuddly, but I can be more polite. Uh, and anyway, so um, the thing is, he's not going away for a super long time. Now, he may, we know that he's going to be, he's committed to come to the Maintainer Summit. That's in Scotland in October 22nd. So that's just, uh, what, about three or four weeks away. Uh, so he's, he hasn't disappeared completely. He, ha he has, uh, uh, so, and, but he's, he's not active. He's, he said he's going to go, um, you know, go actually get some uh, professional help to help guide him in his uh, communications. Um, so part of his leaving, uh, he wanted to kind of uh, start a big discussion. And boy, did it start a big discussion. He uh, accepted a patch from Greg Hartman that replaces the, the previous code of conflict, uh, which was uh, kind of a, um, a statement saying that we should have, you know, we should treat each other well with a new code of conduct. So the new code of conduct is based on a widely used contributor covenant uh, uh, that's been used by, uh, I think it's over 40,000 projects have used it. Um, and there was a lot of discussion in the community uh, about the new code of conduct. Um, and uh, there's main, the way it's phrased, I don't think it's a super great fit 
for the kernel, but because we adopted something that was used in a different context, it was really used in kind of a GitHub context, and the kernel uses an email context for their distributed operations. Uh, there was a lot of concern by maintainers over new responsibilities that they'd be uh, they'd be turned into kind of a, uh, policing people's behavior. They didn't want to do that. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty over enforcement policies uh, because the new code of conduct kind of specifically mentions some things that would that would be a problem. The old one did not. Um, so there's a Linux uh, LWN LWN .net article talking about all of you know kind of the status as we know it right now. There's a lot of questions that will be answered in the future uh, as people kind of work on stuff. Uh, this. This article is a really good one for review. If you do not have access to it, uh, you can ask me. I can forward a link to it uh, to you. Uh, so there's three ways you can get access to the article. You can ask me, and I'll just send you a link. Um, and Or you can subscribe, and that's always a good thing, because LWM.net is a good good thing to support. Uh, or you can just wait a little while, and in a, the model that LWM.net uses is it'll be free to view in a week. So. If your curiosity is not it's not super great, you can just wait a little while and uh, see that. Uh, but I think it's I, my personal opinion is that the new code of conduct is an improvement over what we had. I think there are a couple of things that uh, it's not a perfect fit for the Linux community, but I think the Linux community can start with it and improve it. And I think uh, that in general, having Linus. Uh, you know, say that he does want to see things improve will will help the the community uh, be more welcoming. Uh, in terms of trade associations, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, Linux Foundation chugs along. They're creating more more um, projects every seems like every month. There's several new projects, uh, but there's one in particular that I thought was really interesting. Maybe just because I'm interested in testing, uh, but they're looking at the creation of a kernel CI testing project. So there was a kernel CI project, and uh, most of the developers on that uh, were working at Lenaro, and Lenaro was kind of funding that, but a lot of those developers went to other companies, and in particular, uh, well, some of them went to Colabora, and some went to Bay Libre, but anyway, uh, the project is not really funded anymore by Lenaro. They've, they've been basically doing it in their own time, and uh, so they thought, well, it'd be good they don't want the project to starve. It's doing some really useful stuff. It's finding bugs in the kernel that are getting re reported back and fixed. And so there are a lot of companies that are interested in this. Uh, the project may ex expand in scope if they actually get some funding, uh, but that remains to be seen. Uh, but if you are interested in this, let me know. I can get you the slide deck um, from uh, Kevin Hillman on this project, or you can contact the Linux Foundation and ask them about it. They're shopping this around right now. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, this is something you may want to check out. Um, and then in terms of conferences, uh, this, this last year we had the Embedded Linux Conference, we had the Japan Jamboree in, in June, uh, uh, and that was, uh, oh no, we had Jap Japan Jamborees every quarter. Open Source Summit in Automotive Linux Summit was in June in Tokyo. And then coming up, we've got uh, ELC Europe in, in, in Scotland in October and the Automated Testing Summit, which I referred to earlier. So we've got things continue on the conference thing, and uh, we'll be recording videos at both ELC Europe and the Automated Testing Summit. We have plans to videotape everything. Uh, so if you cannot make it to those events, well, then, then you can still uh, see, see what's going on. Uh, one thing I thought would be interesting is just to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the topics. So I'm on the program committee for ELC Europe, and uh, I think it's interesting to kind of see what people are working on and what they're proposing. I think that's a good kind of indicator uh, of what types of uh, projects we're going to see changes to in the future, or what people's priorities are. So in, in there, we're seeing a lot of kernel drivers. That's normal. Uh, uh, this time around, we saw a lot more AV stuff. So we saw some cam some talks on camera camera interfaces. Looks like it's going through some changes, some changes in audio stuff uh, that people want to tell people about. A lot of testing talks, uh, a lot of Yocto project talks, and then security, bootloader, virtualization, real-time networking. Those are all really standard 
classic things that a lot of, a lot of companies are interested in making sure they get right in their products and uh, using the latest technology from Linux to do it. Uh, in terms of legal issues, this is kind of an older slide, uh, so I'm, I don't think I'm going to go over it again today. Uh, but this is about Patrick McCarty and uh, how Genia Tech in Germany was actually able to fight back successfully. Uh, and uh, so, and then I think there were some lessons learned from that particular court case in Germany. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, I think uh, some companies are, the fact that some companies are successful in fighting uh, Patrick McCarty and in particular in fighting the kind of the notion of copyright trolls is actually good. And uh, so if you want to see more information about this particular legal battle and what happened with it, you can go to that uh, article. Um, and then a couple of things, just industry, in, in the industry. So Intel is selling Wind River. Um, that was that's kind of old news from March, but we're not sure exactly what this means for the Aqua project, although I know that uh, there are um, one of the, uh, Richard Purdy, who was one of the leads on the Octo project, is no longer with Intel. And Intel has just discontinued some of their uh, IoT uh, projects, uh, specifically their hardware board and, and maker style products, Edison, Galileo, and Juul. So uh, we're a little bit concerned about the Octo project. Uh, there's uncertainty. I think it will continue forward. Uh, there's a lot of companies now using it. Uh, hopefully, it's got enough resources to continue. The other interesting thing, just in terms of interest, industry and companies, is uh, Microsoft acquired GitHub, and uh, that is a huge turnaround. That, so Microsoft is in the position of, uh, of kind of uh, controlling kind of the largest single uh, open source development site in the world. Um, and uh, I read some stats just this morning that uh, over 50% of Azure uh, clients are Linux. Uh, which means that in terms of cloud services, uh, Microsoft is really, really interested in Linux. And in fact, some of the Azure infrastructure is on Linux. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a long ways from where Microsoft started in terms of their relationship to Linux and open source. Uh, but I think uh, it's inevitable. You'll see Linux continue to dominate in a lot of areas. And uh, you know, I, previously I've talked about the fact that Microsoft has a board seat uh, they were a platinum member of the Linux Foundation, so I think this is all uh, actually very sincere. It's part of their business to uh, be on the same side as uh, open source and Linux. So, um, in terms of resources, uh, this is just a list of uh, places that I get my information from. You probably saw a lot of my links for LWN.net. It is the premier site if you want to stay up to speed on what's going on with Linux. Uh, I also, when I look for specific features and, and versions of Linux, I look at Colonel Newby's site. They have very good pages there. Uh, Pharonix has a lot of good articles. And then uh, the eLinux wiki site. Uh, this is where actually I go to look for slides. Um, you can, some events that are not embedded, like uh, Open Source Summit, um, you have to go over to the Linux Foundation website to see those slides and those presentations. But, Anything embedded, we try to get up on the uh, elinux.org site. And so there's a lot of great material up there. Uh, anyway, uh, with that, I will uh, thank you for your time. And I will open it up for any questions. Yep. Yes. Um, oh. Hi. <coughs> Hi, Tim. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. and. Uh, uh, for uh, I have uh, several uh, questions, and uh, one is uh, uh, the tool chain. Uh, you are uh, also introducing the uh, GCC eight, but uh, how about uh, LVM uh, crank kernel? You know. Yeah, I have a, um, To my knowledge, I I used to have some slides on that because things were the status was kind of changing. Uh, the in, the kernel was increasing. Uh, in its support for LLVM, uh, and then it, I think it hit kind of a plateau. I don't know what the current status is. Uh, last I checked, there was really kind of one major uh, feature that the kernel was using, and that was variable length arrays uh, that was not supported by LLVM. And there were some out of tree patches to try and fix those, but there was resistance by some of the maintainers in the areas where those those were used. 
So I actually have to admit that I have lost track of what the status of that is. Uh, but there are people who are working on um, uh, making sure that L LLVM can compile the Linux kernel. Uh, but I don't, I don't know the recent status on that. So, do you do you know anything about what the status is? Um, yeah, I have our uh, let's see, one our, uh, presentation in our, uh, Linux Connect last week, and uh, oh, okay. okay, yeah, they said that. Uh, yeah, that is only for ARM32 and uh, <coughs> have uh, some other problem, but uh, uh, it can be uh, com uh, can compile the kernel. But uh, I've heard that uh, uh, recently uh, Google and uh, uh, other team uh, usually using that uh, LLVM uh, for compiling the kernel for uh, ARM64. Oh, okay. Yeah. Team, I think, okay, uh, well, I'll have to go check out your presentation. <laughs> That's interesting. And also one thing is that uh, maybe we will be able to make uh, some of the communication with Robinson of the uh, SIE. Maybe you know well, that is a key core, you know, maintainer of the uh, LLVM. Staying in the Foster City in the uh, Sony PlayStation. Oh, okay, yeah. Hmm. That sounds nice. And, uh, uh, I think that uh, I recommend you to uh, to check that uh, uh, last week's uh, Linux Connect uh, mm -hmm. presentations uh, materials. Uh, most of them them are uh, uploaded now, so uh, you can check that. And uh, there okay. are yeah several uh, what's the uh, themes uh, items are uh, well update the uh, the current situation. Your explanation. Like a uh, uh, year uh, to uh, twenty thirty eight. Ah, uh, yeah, but yeah. was was Arn there last week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably yeah. had more more up to date material than I've got. That's that's a good actually. Uh, now that you mention it, I should probably add that to my list of resources. So, uh, because that's another really great uh, site to get kind of up to date information and yeah. uh, and they also they're one of the other few uh, organizations that videotapes. <coughs> Uh, records all of the events so you can see the slides and the videos, which is really useful. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. Sir. Anything, I, uh, and, anything else? <clears throat> okay, it must be good. Anyway, thank you very much, team, and have a good evening. And uh, maybe uh, you will be able to look into it, uh, uh, find uh, Hiroan-san's slides for this uh, afternoon. And he will make a presentation in Japanese here, but uh, he, his presentation in English is already Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, so you can learn. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll take one of those. <laughs> <laughs> in a, uh, Linux Connect site. Right. Yeah. So you have to look into the Linux Connect site. Anyway. Thank you very much, very, very much, team, and have a good evening. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.